So we have three more framing questions to go over. And then there are four left from this chapter, but one of it you're going to do on your own. Yeah, Ethan. Oh, that's fine. As long as I know who it is. Yeah, if I can't figure out who that person is, you're going to have to stay with your score. All right. So how do we organize living reptiles? Okay. Shh. No, it's, it won't work like that. So you'll get their... I mean, it's basically whichever score's higher, yours or their five, but if they took somebody else, yeah, it won't work that way. That's too complicated because then I have to go back. And... <laughs> All right, anyways. So, shh, This group reptilia, this group reptiles, is not a commonly used taxon anymore. Okay? Now, you still teach it to children... You probably still have chapters in your textbook called Reptiles if you take a class on zoology and not just on biology in general. But this, this name is not commonly used in, in journal articles anymore for several reasons because it's now a very complicated name. Because we, we've talked a little bit about this already, but now is, is a really good time to emphasize that there is a new uh, strategy, if you will, philosophy. That's probably a better term. There's a new philosophy on how you name taxa. So traditionally, it was you got to have a phylum, you got to have a class, you got to have an order, you got to have a family, you got to have a genus, you got to have a species for everything, right? If you discover a new species, you got to put it into all of those taxa. Okay, that's traditionally how it was done. The way it's done now is you name things based on how they came to be. Your names are a representative of their evolutionary history. And so reptiles, this group, has lost a lot of value because there are some difficult questions. One is, did birds descend from a reptilian ancestor? Because if birds descended from something that would be classified as a reptile... The only way to make reptiles still a valuable taxon is to make it also represent birds. Also, did mammals descend from a reptilian ancestor? Because if mammals descended from a reptilian ancestor, the only way to make reptiles still a useful grouping is if mammals are also included when you say reptiles. And so now it becomes a little weird because when Somebody says reptiles, you probably think snake, lizard, crocodile, turtle, right? And so there, there's something meaningful about that. And yet, if your philosophy of how you name organisms has to be a representation of their evolutionary history, you have to include these groups that are believed to have evolved from um, reptiles. We also have some other interesting issues. Turtles are just a conundrum. You're like, I mean, I don't understand what the issue is. They're so awesome, right? And they are. You're right. You give them some of that ooze, and then they become vigilantes and fight crime. <laughs> it's wonderful. So, uh, but we have questions like, are they ancestrally anapsid? And I'll tell you what that means in just a second. But you see this root at the beginning of a word, A or A-N, and you know that means without, right? So it is without something. Um, why are their limbs inside of the rib cage? It's, it's strange. And they are the only groups of vertebrates that are structured that way. And why does their rib cage fuse with the scales? And so turtle skeletons are just really, really complicated. And it makes turtles really difficult to fit into this story. Uh, why do crocodilians have four chambered hearts? They are the only living groups of what traditionally was called a reptile with a four chambered heart, which is like a bird and a mammal heart. This is interesting. So are crocodilians more like birds or are they more like reptiles? And the answer from phylogenetics would be yes, because birds are reptiles. Okay. All right. So this group... Reptilia has been completely modified. It used to be class. You had class reptilia, class aves, class mammalia, and there was reptiles, birds, and mammals. It's not that way anymore. 
Okay, so now you have class reptilia that includes birds. And then you're like, well, what about if mammals came from it as well? So what we do is we, we do this. So organizing living reptiles requires us to spend a little bit of time talking about extinct groups as well. All right, so amniotes. What's an amniote again? We left off on Wednesday talking about why are amniotes special? What is, what is an amniote? Yeah, Allison. So it's a, it's an, yeah, it's, a, it's an animal that lays shelled eggs that protect four extra embryonic membranes. Right? Okay, so amniotes includes reptiles, birds, and mammals. And so the idea here is that this group amniota, the amniotes, split into two main groups very early on in the phylogeny of amniotes. One of those groups is called the synapsids. And again, we'll talk a little bit more about what these terms anapsid, synapsid, and diapsid mean in a minute. But synapsids are the most common amniote in the Paleozoic era. And then the idea is that they, these gave rise to mammals. And so we, we, we don't use the term reptile to discuss these early forms. We just, we call them synapsids. Okay. And then the other of the two main group, the diapsids, which again, we'll talk in just a minute about what these terms, diapsid, synapsid, anapsid mean. <coughs> but the idea here is that some of these anapsid groups actually came out of this group, diapsida, and then diapsida split into two groups. So the diapsid group, reptilians are now, or reptiles are within that group. Not all diapsids are reptiles, but all reptiles are diapsids. Okay? And so reptiles has in some ways shrank in terms of what traditionally, what fossil forms used to be classified as reptiles. Some of those are no longer classified as reptiles, but used instead a more general term. And then in some ways it's grown because now it also includes birds, okay? So the way to kind of sum this up is this, this taxon reptilia has shrunk in terms of extinct forms and grown in, for, in, in the way of living forms and s some extinct groups of birds. And then we still don't have any idea what to do with turtles. And you'll see this represented in a phylogeny that comes right out of your textbook. They, they have it put somewhere, but there's a question mark, and you can find turtles all over the place. Turtles are fun. Wonderful animals. Wonderful animals. But very difficult to figure out where they exist in this phylogeny of life. Of course, if your view of origins holds to that God created different types of life, different kinds of life that then diversified, you don't have as big of an issue. Okay, so here's the whole anapsid, synapsid, diapsid. Here's an anapsid skull. Other than the orbits and the nares, there are no openings in the skull. Okay, so you've got the orbits where the eyes sit. You have the nares where you basically get nostrils go in for uh, chemical for exposing external air to chemical stim, uh, receptors. There are no openings besides the orbits. Here's a synapsid skull, has a single opening besides the orbit and the nares, and then a diapsid skull, di meaning two, has two openings beside the orbit. Now, in terms of the adaptive value of those openings, it varies from group to group. The more openings you have, the lighter your skull has the potential to be, although that's not the only factor in determining how heavy your skull is. Also, the thickness of the bone, how big it is. Okay, so again, we split amniota, which include all of the amniotes, into two groups, the synapsids and the diapsids. And then the diapsids give rise to some of our uh, anapsid groups. Yeah. So did you say if you have more holes in the skull, the lighter the skull Potentially. Is? Oh, okay. 
if all thing if all other things are equal, like the bone is just as thick in a synapsid and a diapsid, and the skull is basically the same length and width, then yes, it would be lighter. All right. So here's a phylogeny out of your textbook. And so here we have the ancestral amniote split into a synapsid and a diapsid group. The diapsid group can split into things that were ancestrally anapsid. Notice it says extinct anapsids, no living groups there. And then diapsid split into those other two groups, Lepidosauria, Archosauria. And then what do we see a lot of in this phylogeny? Polytomies, right? We've got a polytomy here. We have a polytomy here because of we don't know what to do with turtles. Okay, and polytomies are an indication of what? That the evolutionary relationships are unresolved. That we don't know how these things actually fit together. All right. So, before we finish discussing this question, I want to tell you the framing question that was removed and I want you to work on on your own. And that framing question is, why do birds group with theropods? Okay, why do birds group with theropods, which is a type of dinosaur that includes raptors, T-Rex. What's that? Theropod, yeah, it's T-H-E-R-O-P-O-D-S. You'll see it if you go to the slide that lists all the framing questions, it's still there. There are just no slides to address that framing question. So when we look at this, so here's diapsid synapsids, right? Our two groups of amniotes. Within the diapsid lineage, we have archosaurs, and that includes crocodiles, it includes birds, and then a bunch of extinct groups. Pterosaurs, and then two different types of dinosaurs. Now this is kind of fun. Oh, I'll wait on this one. Okay, so <laughs> birds, two different types of extinct dinosaurs, pterosaurs, and then crocodilians. Okay, any question here? Yeah, Levi. So, um, people, mammals are diapsids, right? Mammals are synapsids. Okay. Yep. So, the, the whole, is that the group whole, or is that the... No, not usually. Okay, so yeah. is it the, the whole, No, no, no. So, in... in in a human skull, you don't see that, that opening still. But so you get modifications on the plan uh, within these different groups. So a human skull doesn't bear that feature any longer, but humans are well anchored within that group for other reasons. Yeah, this is a good question. All right, so here, uh, an artist's representation of pterosaurs Keeping in mind that these are one of our groups in archosaurs along with dinosaurs, crocodilians, and birds. Speaking of crocodilians, here's a crocodilian. And so crocodilians invest a lot in parental care. Birds invest a lot in parental care. So of our archosaurs, only two groups have living species, both of which invest a lot in parental care. So a lot of that is used to suggest that dinosaurs and pterosaurs probably also invested a lot in parental care. And then you do see some mama dinosaurs buried with their eggs or buried with little tiny forms of the adult dinosaur. And so there are some evidence to support that. All right. And then here are a couple of examples of living reptiles so this is not part of archosauria, but our other part of diapsids, right? Because archosaurs are just crocodiles and birds as far as living forms. So your lizards, your snakes, and your turtles, who knows what to do with those? Those are a different group of diapsids. Here's a lizard, here's a snake, and then here's a turtle. A turtle that's also a tortoise. All tortoises are turtles, but not all turtles are tortoises. Turtles is a more general group. Anyways, that's another story for another class, not this one. Okay. All right. Any questions about this one? How do we organize reptiles? 
And so again, if you can explain what's happened with that group reptilia, that's gonna be helpful. If you can talk about that, there's some confusion. So now reptiles includes birds and it starts later. Okay, some things that would have been traditionally classified as reptiles are now classified using a more general term, like just diapsid. And that term reptile is used to emphasize something more specific. All right. So our next framing question, and this is where we'll take our lecture break in just a moment. But how are mammals unique? How are mammals unique? So as far as what I just told you, they are separate from birds and mammals because they are not in diapsida. They are instead in what? Synapsida, right? Look at that. Already applying that. It's good. Love it. So remember that mammals are in the synapsid lineage. This would be one thing that would make mammals unique. Although if we left it there, that would be sad, right? To have a slide with one term and a term that you already saw on a previous slide. You would be dissatisfied, and I know that. So I will give you more. So within the synapsid lineage, there are several different forms. One of those forms are the synodonts. And the idea is that modern mammals came from these synodonts. Some people say synodont. I think both are correct. But this is boring special things about mammals. What are some unique things about mammals? Yeah, Levi. Oh, yeah, absolutely. And that is actually one of the few that is overwhelmingly obvious in all living mammal forms, that they produce milk uh, to feed their, their young. Yeah, Amanda. Um, they all have live young. They all bear live young unless it's a platypus or a echidna. You've got some egg-laying mammals, but those are strange. We don't know what to do with those either. <laughs> so those, those are kind of like turtles of the mammals. Like we just, we don't know exactly what to do with those. Yeah, Micah. Bilateral symmetry. Bilateral symmetry, they certainly do. Although so do some others. Okay, they've got fur. They have mammary glands and other complex gram glands. Wow, <laughs> not grams. And are usually viviparous. This is give li gives live birth. But again, we've got some that don't, but we don't know what to do with those. So they produce fur, but not all of them are, are soft. Right? Some of that fur is modified into some very strange structures, like pangolins. If you don't know what a pangolin is, you should find out what a pangolin is. Yeah, Cameron. Ish. They have structures that are modified hairs used for sensory purposes. Yeah. But they don't need fur as an insulation because they have blubber. And so uh, they, yeah, that'd be really cool though to see just a whale covered in fur. That'd be a, that'd be a neat animal. All right. So another thing, mammals, including us, we have three bones in the middle ear. So we've got the, stap the stapes, the incus, and the malleus, right? Ear. ear. Oh my goodness, <laughs> not air, ear. Well, that persisted. Well, that's awesome. That should say ear, but whatever, we'll go with air. Um, compared to the only one that you find in early synapsids, and living reptiles. They have a single bone in their inner ear. Mammals have three, and so the idea there is that bones in the lower jaw moved and migrated into the inner ear to provide a greater ability to differentiate different frequencies of sound. And what's interesting is living reptiles have three bones in the lower jaw, and mammals have one. So you've got two less bones in the lower jaw, two more bones in the inner ear, right? The numbers work out. And then we've got this genus, Yanaconodon, that has three bones in the middle ear physically attached to the lower jaw. Like it was caught in the action of moving those bones into the inner ear. Well, 
We'll talk about what do we, what do we do with this later. But it's a very interesting it's a very interesting story you can show as you're going from a very early synapsid into a modern mammal and the movement of these jaw bones into the inner ear. Oh, sure. So yeah. Oh, yeah. Yes, in fossil forms. In living mammals, they almost entirely look the same, but in fossil forms, absolutely. Yep, absolutely. All right. So, again, we'll talk about what to do with that in a little bit. Uh, living mammals are grouped into three taxa. The monotremes, they lay eggs, and look at this. I put, they confound mammal phylogenies. That's a really good statement. You're welcome for that one. It's just we don't know what to do with them. They are like the turtles of mammals. We don't know what to do with them. Marsupials have a short gestation period, but then a very long lactation period. And so if you do e an equal size marsupial to a placental mammal, like a kangaroo and a deer, the kangaroo gives birth to the joey way before the deer gives birth to the fawn. But when you include lactation, the joey spends a lo much longer time nursing than the deer does. And then kangaroos, I mean, they can, they, they stagger their pregnancies so they can have a joey in the pouch, a joey developing in the womb, and another fertilized egg waiting to implant in the uterus when that joey gets evicted. It's awesome. Oh, and then the other group, placentals. Longer gestation period than marsupials, but again, gestation plus lactation is shorter than in marsupials. We have one native, well, it's not really native, but we have one marsupial in North America. It is, I guess you could sort of consider it native, but we can, we can find when it actually came from South America. You can find that in the fossil record. But do you know what it is? Possum. It's the possum. Technically the opossum, the Virginia opossum looks like a giant rat. I've, so, I've seen one. Oh, I've seen many. They are awesome. Okay, anyways, the gestation period for the opossum is 13 days. 13 days after conception, the baby opossums are born. But then they spend another three to four months inside of the pouch, nursing and growing, so that by the time you actually see them, they are not the size they are at birth, which is about the size of a dime. Yep. All right. So here we go. Here's our lecture break. So how can we explain the movement of bones from the jaw into the middle ear? Okay. How do we explain that? Because it seems to be a, a very convincing story, right? As if mammals came, we believe mammals came from synapsids for a number of reasons. And then you see as you start to get further and further or more and more recent in the fossil record, you're starting to see the movement of these bones from the lower jaw into the middle ear. And then finally you get modern mammals show up and it's fully moved into the middle ear. Okay. So how do we explain this? Take three minutes, see if you can come up with some explanations for this phenomenon. Three minutes, starting now. And here's, here's the, here are the, or here are the three bones, Malleus, Incus, Stapes. Living reptiles and early synapsids only had the stapes. Yes. Oh, no, I was in 
I, I mean, well, what it allows them to do is move those, move those uh, fetuses into a separate chamber, right? The pouch, and then they can get pregnant again with another batch. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's like moving. Oh yeah. But it's like moving, uh, say you're, you're, have you ever been to a Krispy Kreme Donuts and watch them make the donuts? It's like as soon as they come off the conveyor, putting them into like a warmer box to keep them warm. It's like, what's the benefit of that? Well, I mean, it gets them out of the way so you can keep making more, right? Where a placental mammal can't because there's something just sitting in the, in the uterus for a longer period of time. All right. Somebody have an answer for us? Hang on, well, before, uh, well, we'll get your answer, Faith. Sorry, uh, Micah asked, what, what's the benefit of that marsupial birthing strategy, right? Where you, you give birth to something that's really, really small and fragile, and you actually have to physically move them to the pouch. Isn't that going to result in a number of offspring being lost? Potentially, but it, it allows you to clear out the uterus for the next batch of opossums to be born. And so you can just, and I use the analogy of like the, 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 the conveyor belt of donuts at the Krispy Kreme, right? Pull those, pull those donuts right off that conveyor belt, put them into a warming area, and then it opens up room for more donuts to just keep on coming. Keep on coming. Did you have a question about that? Okay, yeah. Yes, absolutely. Mm-hmm. All right, Faith. Okay, I love it. Yes. Yep, at being able to distinguish different frequencies of sound. There's no doubt that mammals hear better than living reptiles. Okay. Sure. Okay. Yeah. Tara. Sure. So, so, so far we're explaining this in terms of like the adaptive value of having those middle ear bones, which is there's certainly an adaptive value to having that. Really, the, what makes this a difficult question to answer is why does this look so convincing that mammals did in fact evolve from synapsids and that they, when, when, when what, what, you know, the biblical, like a, a, a historical reading of Genesis 1 through 11 would suggest that many of these groups of mammals were created separately. And yet we have something that looks like that mammals did, in fact, evolve from synapsids. Yeah. Are there any reasons to know why the friend look the same across a bunch of different animals because God uses the same structures and uses the same blueprints? Sure, the same design pattern. 
Yeah, and I think we should expect to see kind of a continuum of different types of structures in the middle ear, right? I mean, you should expect to find some for animals that aren't going to rely as much on hearing as others. We would expect to see more of a continuum. What we might not expect to see is them to show up in the right order, right? The continuum you'd expect to see really regardless of what your view of origins is. You should expect there to be some variation in the structure of the middle ear based on like Tara, what you were talking about, and Faith, what you were talking about, about the the environmental need to be able to rely more on hearing, right? And so you'd expect that continuum regardless of what your view of origins is. What you might not expect is for them to show up in that order in the fossil record. That's where it gets a little bit more interesting unless you remind yourself that the alternative to the fossil record being a history of Earth's past is that instead it's an order of environments buried during a global flood. And so you're, you're burying environments in a particular order, therefore you now might expect to see some of this evidence of order of moving through various forms. Levi? Oh, it's oh yeah, it's pretty convincing, okay. and they show up. It, they show up in in like almost a perfect order. But at the same time that that's happening, happening, other structures don't make sense. So if all you look at are the bones in the middle ear as you move to more recent deposits in the fossil record, it tells a very very convincing story. Until you look at the entire skeleton of those animals, and then that story's like, wow, this doesn't really. This doesn't really make sense anymore because there are other things that that look like they appear in the wrong order, other skeletal features. This is just one skeletal feature. There are other skeletal features that look like they appear in the exact opposite order of what you would anticipate. So you're, it looks like you are looking at more of an environmental continuum than an actual you know, evolutionary progression, that you're looking at more of an environmental progression environments like what Tara and you and Faith you guys were talking about that 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 force organisms to rely more on sound as a as a stimulus so here's a, a synodont again an artist representation of it sometimes just commonly referred to as mammal like reptiles which is absurd because these are not reptiles right we've moved what the whole meaning of reptile is don't ever use that term mammal-like reptile. And if you hear somebody else using that term, remind them that reptiles was moved more recent to avoid those issues, right? Right, okay. Anyways, so here are some monotremes. Duck-billed platypus on the left. One of the four species of echidna on the right or sp spiny anteater, egg-laying mammals. So there are five living species of egg-laying mammals. Here's the Tasmanian devil. A, uh, a marsupial native to Australia and Tasmania. They are, they are actually very cute. Tasmanian devils are very interesting. So they have the marsupial life history where you know, very short gestation, long lactation, but the way they're, uh, the embryos portion of the placenta develops is like a placental mammal and not like a marsupial. So I told you placental mammals, the embryonic form of the placenta is a combination of the chorion and the amnion. In, in, in marsupials, it tends to be the chorion and the yolk sac. And, but in this one, it's the amnion and the chorion, like a placental mammal. It's very strange, but they have a marsupial life history. That's bonus information. And they're awesome. Yeah, Faith. I don't know. Yeah, I don't know the origins. I don't know the origins of the name. Probably something to do with them killing. I, I imagine that they are just just rampant eaters of people's agricultural animals. And so that that built into the, the folklore behind their name. But I don't know. Yeah, Ethan. I heard it's because they like make a really nasty sound. Oh, they do make a really nasty sound. That's true. 
All right, and here's a placental mammal, another animal that makes a really disturbing sound, a howler monkey. All right, the last question we are going to talk about together uh, is how are different hominin species related? So what do we do with evidence of multiple species of humans existing? What do we do with this from a view of origins that holds that, that humans have a completely different story than the rest of God's creation and that they are designed in God's image for his service, right? Very different uh, story. So we have this question of what does it mean to be human? And so we're going to do a short lecture break right now, and I know we don't have a ton of time left, but I, I, I'm okay with us finishing this discussion on Monday. Um, but the question is, what does it mean to be human? Take about two minutes and come up with a, an answer to that question. Tell us what it means to be human. All right? Two minutes, starting now. Specific created posture that God is the degree to, you guys are saying, that God delighted to be in a relationship. Oh, it's still that way, but we're actually also, even being the pinnacle of creation, also. All right. What does it mean to be human? Okay, so we have a definition of what it means to be human. It is something made in the image of God. Now, what's interesting is... Um, Oh, never mind. I'm not, I, I won't. We'll, we'll, we'll have. I'll, be, I'll mention something on Monday that that'll make that interesting. Okay, made in the image of God. Love it. Any other ideas on what it means to be human? Yeah, Allison. Um, abstract thought. Okay, capable of abstract thought. Yeah, Micah. Okay. Okay. To maintain uh, accuracy in the message, Levi. Uh, an awareness of self. Okay, an awareness of self. You know, what's interesting is <laughs> the awareness of self is it's complicated to define what that means because there are other animals capable of recognizing themselves in a mirror, right? Chimpanzees can do it. Elephants can do it. There's some other animals that can do it where they can they can recognize themselves in a mirror and know that it's them and not some random individual of their species, which is really fascinating. Yeah, Faith and then Hayden. Um, and sure, yeah. Right, we can communicate graphically, communicate orally. And then I guess the ability to see the Okay. Not all mammals can see. Sure. You know, there's, a, there's an animal called the mantis shrimp, and it sees in way more colors than we do. They have, I think, four different types of cone cells, and we have two. And so they can probably see in several millions of times more colors than we can. Yeah. Which is interesting. Cameron. Um, you can say humans are beings of higher intelligence that allow us to um, process morals and develop emotions. 
Okay. Yeah. Ethan. Uh, it was actually connected to that. It was like, do, are you familiar with any studies like there was one where the monkeys, like, they're given grapes and like cucumbers and separately, like, they're dissatisfied, um, like, getting the grape or the cucumber, but when one sees the other getting something that has more sugar in it, they have, they like, they'll throw the cucumber away. And, and someone would say that that's an indication of like the beginning of an understanding of fairness or like morals. Like, what do you sure. think? So there, there are several different degrees of learned behavior. And so learned behavior is where you're starting to get more sophisticated to where it's not innate, right? It's not robotic, but it's actually learned. So you have what's called associative learning, and many animals are capable of that. Uh, you see that in dogs where you learn to associate some cue with something else, right? And so there's the classical conditioning Experiments done with dogs where they would ring a bell and then feed it and ring a bell and then feed it Ring a bell and then feed it and then you ring a bell and it starts to salivate Because it learns to associate being fed with the ringing of a bell And so that's a type of learned behavior Then you have like a, a visual learning where you learn to associate a particular image With an event and so that's a more sophisticated form of learning uh, more sophisticated than associative learning, but still a number of animals are capable of that. And then there's cognition, where you can actually problem solve and you can start to understand um, certain things. It's hard to know, are you, start, are you understanding this concept of, of justice, right, of fairness, or instead are you associating, you know, It'd be interesting, so I'm not aware of the, the data for that, but it'd be interesting to know if they do that the first time they ever see it. If they just notice another individual's being fed something different, or if they've already eaten that before, and so they know that they would rather that because they've associated an image with a particular experience. But there are certainly animals that, that show evidence of having cognition. That what you, what you might consider other than other than maybe rationality, right? Or the ability to think as something else, the highest form of learned behavior, cognition. There are, there are animals that show evidence of that where they can problem solve and figure things out. So if, if, a, if a monkey can understand the concept of justice, I, I don't know if, if that's a really big issue, unless of course your definition of the image of God is intelligence, right? Then you have an issue because it's just like, okay, well, at what point does it now, now you have the image of God and you don't. And then so if somebody lacks the mental capacity to problem solve, do they no longer bear the image of God? Right? This is sort of like oh, absolutely. Yeah, but you can't answer the question, what does it mean to be human without it being philosophical? We're out of time, but if you, you write it down. Because we'll, we'll, we'll continue this on Monday. Have a wonderful weekend. Be safe.